They have long been recognized as the backbone of the United States Army. Ladies and gentlemen, the creed of the non-commissioned officer. No one is more professional than I. The corporals, the sergeants. I am a member of a time-honored corps. The proud warriors who so adeptly perform as small unit leaders, trainers, and guardians of standards. Competence is my watchword. They are respected for their professionalism. I will strive to remain tactically and technically proficient. For their commitment to knowledge. I know my soldiers and I will always place their needs above my own. And for their enduring capacity for selfless service. I will not forget. Nor will I allow my comrades to forget. That we are professionals. Non-commissioned officers. Leaders. Congratulations on your acceptance and commitment to the Non-Commissioned Officer Corps. Take this manual as a guide to train and challenge our soldiers. Ho, oh. oh. Non-Commissioned Officers in the U.S. Army share the pride of a rich history of accomplishment. NCOs were crucial in transforming General George Washington's Continental Army into a battle-worthy arm capable of going up against British regulars on the battlefield. On the Western Frontier, NCOs accepted responsibility for leading scouting parties to locate enemy forces. During the Civil War, they embraced the deadly task of carrying the colors so commanders could locate and maneuver their units. When the flag moved, the lines moved as well. In World War I, squad leaders began supervising fire teams instead of just individual soldiers, reflecting their ability to adapt to the changing technologies and circumstances of warfare. During World War II, Korea, and Vietnam, young NCOs continued to refine their effectiveness as small unit leaders. Through revolution, civil war, world wars, regional wars, and operations for the protection of national interests, NCOs have carried forward the best traditions of their corps. While officers command units, NCOs lead soldiers, train them, inspire excellence, and stand strong as paragons of professionalism. leaders of the American Revolution drew on the military traditions of Europe as they created an army. But in the fighting that ensued, the army evolved and the role of the American NCO became unique. It was during this time that NCOs first assumed the role they continue today as guardians of standards. In 1779, former Prussian General Friedrich von Steuben Washington's appointee, as Inspector General of the Army, wrote the first regulations for duties and responsibilities for non-commissioned officers. These regulations, commonly called the Blue Book, spell out the duties and responsibilities of NCOs and became the official military manual for the next 30 years. The Blue Book required the Sergeant Major to be well acquainted with the internal management and discipline of the regiment. It charged the first sergeant with discipline of the company, good conduct of the men, their exactness in obeying orders, and regularity of their manners. Today, the maintenance of these standards are as relevant as they were over two centuries ago. During the revolution, the new army developed a system for the identification of NCOs through the use of different colored epaulets to distinguish rank, duties, and branches. From the beginning, NCOs have served bravely and with distinction in America's armies. Three sergeants in the Continental Army received the newly created Badge of Military Merit for acts of heroism. Today, 
We call this award the Purple Heart. One of the sergeants was William Brown. It is believed that Sergeant Brown led the advance party against Redoubt Number 10 at Yorktown. Instead of waiting for the approach to be cleared, he masterminded a surprise assault. Using only their bayonets, the Americans ignored musket fire and grenades, leapt over barriers and captured the position within 10 minutes. His action led to the surrender of the British four days later. Sergeant Elijah Churchill and Sergeant Daniel Bissell received the badge for similar acts of heroism. NCOs also played a significant role in America's westward expansion. The Army launched several expeditions to explore the lands of the Louisiana Purchase between 1803 and 1812. And all of these expeditions included enlisted men and NCOs. One of them, Sergeant Patrick Gass, was a veteran soldier. He began his military career when he volunteered to take his father's place in the Virginia militia fighting against the Indians. He made sergeant in General Alexander Hamilton's 19th Regiment during the Revolution. After a break in service, he joined Captain Meriwether Lewis for the Northwest Expedition and regained his stripes when he replaced a sergeant who died. Sergeant Gass succeeded in leading his men across the continent and back with no further loss of life. He published a journal of the expedition, which today provides us with detailed knowledge of that journey. Gass remained in the army and fought with distinction in the War of 1812 before he retired. The evolution of NCOs continued through the 1800s. In 1812, Red sashes and swords were added to the uniform for sergeants and above to distinguish their positions as non-commissioned officers. A few years later, in 1821, the Army changed the rank identification system again. NCOs were identified by chevrons rather than epaulets and sashes. Some units wore the point up and some down. By 1851, however, all units wore the chevrons with the point down and would do so for more than 50 years. The first school for instruction of enlisted men opened at Fort Monroe in 1824. Though suspended from time to time, it served as a precursor for modern technical training. The abstract of infantry tactics published in 1829 provided instructions specifically for training NCOs. The purpose of this instruction centered on ensuring all NCOs possessed an accurate knowledge of the exercise and use of their firelocks, of the manual exercise of the soldier, and of the firings and marching. The Army's personnel requirements continued to expand. Garrison troops were needed to maintain peace among different Indian tribes. The opening of the Santa Fe Trail in the 1820s created a need for mounted soldiers. They were considered elite troops and were required to be native-born American citizens. Immigration dramatically changed the army from 1840 onward. Irish and German immigrants composed large numbers of many units. Ulysses S. Grant estimated that over half the army during this period consisted of men born in foreign countries. In 1840, NCOs adopted the distinctive sword they still use today. It has always been more of a symbol of rank than a weapon of war because it is ill-balanced. Nearly two-thirds of troops in the Mexican War from 1846 to 1848 were volunteers. NCOs had the difficult task of leading these brave citizen soldiers to Mexico City and victory. During the Civil War, the use of more open battle formations enhanced the combat leadership role of NCOs. They led the lines of skirmishers that preceded each unit, and they also carried the flags and regimental colors of their units. 
Corporal Peter Welch, a member of the 28th Massachusetts, carried the colors for his Irish brigade. During the Civil War, racial and ethnic groups often made up entire army units. After the Civil War, non-commissioned officers helped rebuild the nation by establishing outposts of protection for settlers moving west. During the Indian Wars, troops often fought in small detachments. With few officers available, they relied heavily on the knowledge and abilities of their NCOs. The Army discontinued most ethnic units after the Civil War, but African-American Buffalo soldiers of the 24th and 25th Infantry and 9th and 10th Cavalry went on to make significant contributions in the years to come. One Buffalo soldier, Sergeant George Jordan, Troop K, 9th Cavalry, received the Medal of Honor for actions during the campaign against the Apache leader Victorio in 1880. Sergeant Jordan led a 25-man detachment to Tularosa, New Mexico to meet a coming attack. Standing firm against more than 100 Apaches, he and his men prevented the town's destruction. Training of NCOs continued to evolve in the second half of the 1800s. In 1869, the Signal Corps established a school for training officers and NCOs at Fort Whipple, now known as Fort Myer. This school, along with the reopening of the artillery school at Fort Monroe in 1870, helped Signal Corps and artillery soldiers gain the advanced technical knowledge needed to operate complex equipment and instruments. The early 1900s brought several changes for NCOs. In 1902, the Army decided that chevrons should be worn with the points up, and they are still worn that way today. A few years later, in 1909, the Non-Commissioned Officer's Manual more clearly defined the duties of the NCO than previous publications. The growth of warfighting technology in the 20th century continued to influence the NCO Corps. The demand for specialists grew with the development of increasingly sophisticated armor, aviation, motorized transport, and chemical warfare. The Army was forced to compete with industry for technical workers and compensated NCOs accordingly. World War I required the first massive training the U.S. had seen, and NCOs trained four million soldiers. During the late 1930s, the Army separated specialists and technicians from the NCO Corps and designated their rank with a special T chevron. This left the NCO Corps comprised of only soldiers who were leaders of men. As time went on, the Army had to decide whether high-ranked specialists really were NCOs. The answer has sometimes been yes and sometimes been no. Right now, the answer is yes, and only one rank of specialists exists in the Army. In World War II, mobilization created a staggering growth in the number of NCOs and also their percentage in the Army. From the Continental Army of the 1780s, when NCOs made up less than 20% of the enlisted force, the NCO portion grew during World War II to over 50%. Today, NCOs make up about 80% of the enlisted force. Also during World War II, the Army re-engineered the eight-man infantry squad to include 12 soldiers, and the sergeant replaced the corporal as its leader. Corporals by tradition had been combat leaders. They lost prestige when they no longer commanded squads. Today, there are relatively few corporals in the Army. The Army created the Women's Army Corps in 1943. WAC NCOs performed such diverse duties as motor pool mechanics and drivers, as well as clerks and radio and telephone operators. Ever since, Female NCOs have been an important and productive element of the NCO Corps. Throughout World War II, NCOs continued to distinguish themselves. On D-Day, Staff Sergeant Harrison Summers led an assault against German coastal fortifications. When his 12-man squad encountered heavy fire, 
he advanced alone to the enemy position, kicked the door open, and killed all the enemy soldiers inside. In the post-World War II era, the Army dropped technical ratings as it placed emphasis on service-wide standards for NCO selection and training. More than ever before, it encouraged young soldiers to become better educated in order to advance their careers. Emphasis on the NCO education resulted in the implementation of a career guidance plan and the founding of NCO academies right after World War II. Both became precursors of the present Army personnel and school systems. During the Korean conflict, the NCO emerged more prominently as a battle leader than he had in World War II due to the grueling terrain that forced many units to advance as squads. The role of the NCO as a small unit leader was crucial. It was during the Korean conflict that the Army began to racially integrate and fight on the battlefield side by side. In 1958, the Army added the E-8 and E-9 grades for NCOs. These additions completed the grade structure we still use today. The Vietnam War brought considerable change to the NCO Corps. In Vietnam, NCOs assumed much of the burden of combat leadership. To train the large numbers of new NCOs needed for combat, the Army created the Non-Commissioned Officer Candidate Course at Forts Benning, Knox, and Sill in 1967. It was the immediate precursor of today's NCOES. William O. Wooldridge was chosen to be the first Sergeant Major of the Army in 1966. His mission was to advise the Chief of Staff on all matters pertaining primarily to enlisted soldiers and their families. Wooldridge helped establish the position of Command Sergeant Major in 1968, a move which further enhanced the professionalism of NCOs. As the Vietnam War wound down, the Army moved to build on the changes toward a professional NCO Corps begun during the conflict. In 1971, it established the Non-Commissioned Officer Education System. Today, the U.S. Army Sergeant's Major Academy, located at Biggs Army Airfield, Texas, writes all NCOES Common Core lessons. In the decade of the 70s, information technology began to make an impact on the NCO Corps. The Army developed the Enlisted Personnel Management System to take advantage of the new technology. More than ever before, the Army could place the right NCOs in units around the world and could see that they received education and training at the proper time. As America neared the dawn of the 21st century, the Army focused on the protection of national interests abroad. In 1991, Operation Desert Storm spotlighted the professional NCO in action. Over 300,000 Army troops forced Iraq to concede to a ceasefire after only 100 hours of ground combat. After action reports from Somalia and Kosovo celebrated the professionalism, bravery, and selfless service of non-commissioned officers. Sergeant First Class Randall Shugart and Master Sergeant Gary Gordon, each equipped with only a sniper rifle and a pistol, endured intense small arms fire from the enemy in Mogadishu and fought their way to a dense maze of shanties to reach a critically injured helicopter crew that had crashed. Their actions saved the pilot's life. Sergeant Christine Roberts, a flight medic in Kosovo, rode a jungle penetrator 200 feet down into a steep ravine to search for a soldier who had stepped on a landmine. Disregarding the potential danger from other mines, she successfully treated the soldier and loaded him onto a hoist so he could be transported to a hospital. The Army awarded her the Soldier's Medal, its highest peacetime award. Now in the early years of the 21st century, the war on terrorism continues to demand a rapid military response from soldiers trained to peak levels of readiness.
September 11, 2001, changed the world forever. All of this was brought upon us in a single day. And night fell on a different world. A world where freedom itself is under attack. In the aftermath of terrorist attacks on America, our military active duty, reservists, National Guard, and Department of Defense civilians were called upon to demonstrate without a doubt what America was made of. When joint multinational forces entered Afghanistan in Operation Enduring Freedom, soldiers had to adapt and excel in warfighting circumstances on challenging terrain. Meanwhile, force protection at home stations depends on combined efforts of troops not deployed. During Operation Iraqi Freedom, coalition forces brought the oppressive regime of Saddam Hussein to an end and began the process of rebuilding this long-suffering country with a flag of freedom. Warfighting in Baghdad and other centers of population prove the importance of our training and expertise when conducting military operations on urban terrain. As the future force evolves, soldiers of the future will have the means to make the most of real-time information. Rapid response warfighting vehicles and uniforms with built-in communication, data retrieval, and navigation systems will give soldiers capabilities that commanders of the past only envision. After more than two centuries of evolution, effective training continues to be the cornerstone of operational success. The NCO Corps has proved to be up to speed in meeting rapid response challenges and is eager to fulfill a meaningful role in the Army's transformation to the future force. As the leader most responsible for individual and small unit training, the NCO is vital in building the foundation for the future. The professionalism of the Corps today is largely due to its ability to manage the force with the interchangeability of positions, the establishment of the non-commissioned officers education system to foster common standards, and the creation of the position of the Sergeant Major of the Army, who is the spokesman both up and down for the Army's NCO Corps. In every organization, pride is born from individual achievement and knowledge of the organization's rich history. The history of the non-commissioned officer corps gives us great reason to be proud. The objective force leaders of the year 2020 and beyond are listening and learning in PLDC courses today, ready to be tomorrow's small unit leaders, trainers, and guardians of standards. We salute the non-commissioned officers at all levels. Ladies and gentlemen. They are our hope, our pride, and our future as they begin to write the next chapter in the history of the NCO.